Kick it! Welcome to Next Level Nerds Movie Podcast, where we share our love of movies with you. Yes, you, uh, Christine. <laughs> I don't know. Christine, 16. She's only 17. Is that Winger? Uh, Abba, maybe? Uh, I don't think so. I think that's Winger. That's Dancing Queen you're thinking of. But uh, most, no, yeah. Okay, most of right. the time, we discuss, defend, and promote movies we enjoy that weren't considered critically or commercially successful. And sometimes we just ramble about movies we like. So we started this podcast because Mitchell and I are best friends who wanted to promote positivity on the internet and negate the negative. Plus, we love movies. So please remember to send us all the likes and positive reviews you can and share the podcast with friends and family. We're on a multitude of platforms such as iTunes, Stitcher, and Spotify, so we should be pretty easy to find. However, if you'd like to take your nerdiness to the next level, go to patreon.com slash nextlevelnerd and send us a dollar or two uh, just to help us grow and improve the podcast and the over NLN community. We've got a lot of ideas for some uh, newer shows and we're continuing to expand with... uh, Shows like uh, 321 Lay On, our LARPing podcast. Um, we're also getting ready to, or we're in discussions for uh, some shows about gaming, uh, shows about uh, uh, dads, uh, you know, nerdy dad topics, um, and also uh, uh, TV shows and that kind of thing. We're, we're really looking to aggressively expand and that's our uh, that's our goal right now. Um, so let's uh, let's jump in and nerd out. I'm Justin. He's Mitchell. And this week we're talking about the Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou. Yes, classic. Well, for some, anyways. For some. So this is a 2004 movie. The movie's tagline is "The deeper you go, the weirder it gets." And that is such a perfect tagline. It perfectly explains what this movie is about. And, you know, you're about to dive deeply into flawed characters and it's going to get weird. Very weird. I agree with that. And if you full on hop aboard that boat, then completely let yourself go in that, that world that is created, then you might have a good time. Yeah, it is a uh, this is a Wes Anderson flick, which if you're familiar with Wes Anderson, he he has um, the Isle of Dogs uh, coming out uh, or it might be out by now. Um, probably by the time you hear this, is it is out. I saw it up for pre-order on iTunes just recently, um, it, which, you know, this the Isle of Dogs is kind of shot more in the style of the fantastic Mr. Fox, which is like a. Uh, it's a old doll uh, book that he kind of uh, adapted into like a stop motion um, movie. Uh, it's kind of a really unique style. Um, he's also uh, famous for the Grand Budapest Hotel Rushmore, which was his second movie uh, after Bottle Rocket, uh, Moonrise Kingdom, and probably his most popular movie, The Royal Tannenbaums. Um, which I, I'm always, you know, kind of, when I think Wes Anderson movies, I always think Royal Tannenbaums and The Life Aquatic are like number one and number two, but they're interchangeable for me. You know, just kind of the mood that I'm in. Um, Royal Tannenbaums is more of like a kind of a cold weather, like, like, Put it on TV on like a Saturday morning when there's no football on or no, uh, you know, just kind of want to chill on the couch. And uh, The Life Aquatic is more of an active watching movie for me. That is really good. And I agree with that. The Life Aquatic, it feels more. It's a warmer climate movie, which is great for right. the rainy weather because obviously they're out in the ocean hunting right. wildlife and such in the sea 
the Royal, I feel like the Life Aquatic was a step away from the Royal Tenenbaums just because it obviously was in a different world. Right. And, and that world was something, I don't know, maybe it's me longing for the sea or being a fan of the Cousteau fan Foundation. Mm. I was able to identify with the Life Aquatic a little bit more and the soundtrack being all Bowie in Portuguese. Right. So... I, yeah, like you said, most of the most of the soundtrack is Portuguese versions of Dave, David Bowie songs. Um, the Rebel, Rebel. Uh, what else does he do? Changes. Um, there's a few Bowie songs on there. Life on Mars, but it's the Bowie version. Mm, the Bowie version. Good call. Great the, scene, by the way. Yeah. The um, there's a couple songs on there by Mark Mothersbaugh from Devo which um, he recently scored uh, uh, Thor Ragnarok. Um, Mark Mothersbaugh is probably one of my favorite, um, most eccentric uh, movie uh, soundtrack um, people. You know, he's right up there with like Alan Silvestri and and uh, shoot, what's the name of the dude that did... Um, What's the name of the dude that did uh, Batman versus Superman? Not Junkie XL, but the other guy. German mm. German name. Hans Zimmer. Yeah, Hans Zimmer. Yeah. And, and also there's a really good usage of uh, Search and Destroy by Iggy and the Stooges um, that comes into play in this movie. And uh, that song's kind of out of place as far as the soundtrack goes it's probably the most aggressive song on the soundtrack but during the scene that it plays it is it plays very well into into what's going on on screen uh and it that song after i watch this movie is always stuck in my head uh i'm a street walking boy with a heart full of napalm (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah good one so anyways the movie stars uh bill murray and he's the zisu he is steve zisu uh, he's the zisu and this is a movie where bill murray really gets to exercise his genius in the role by creating like a complex character who always speaks his mind and has no filter whatsoever and that's one of the best parts about this movie is that you can tell that him and Wes Anderson, uh, along with Owen Wilson, who is kind of one of like Wes Anderson's staple actors. I think he's been in every Wes Anderson movie since Bottle Rocket, um, being that the two of them went to college together at the University of Texas, I think it was, or Texas A&M. And... Um, you know they are they have worked together several times along with um, their Owen Wilson's brother Luke Wilson, um, but you can tell these guys are kind of on the same wavelength with the deadpan delivery and kind of the the pacing of the movie. But but Wes Anderson really lets his actors um, kind of exercise the obscurity of the characters and give them the uh the quirks and the the small nuance that they that they're able to put into every role like these characters in any wes anderson movie are never one-dimensional all the characters are ridiculously three-dimensional you know from you know especially in this movie zisu is is probably one of the most far out characters Um, you know, he just, he has tons of little quirks about him. The way he talks is, is like, he's just such a bastard, but you just, for some reason you, you want him to, I, and I don't know if it's because it's Bill Murray, you are rooting for him the whole time, even though he is a complete prick the whole movie. And it's not till really the very end of the movie that you're like, okay, well now he's like, 30% 30% less of a dickhead, you know? Well, that's just part of telling the story. Everyone likes to see the character change for the better. Yeah. And it definitely helps that it's Bill Murray, obviously, because, I mean, it's freaking Bill Murray. Mm-hmm. And even 
he was great in Rushmore and yeah. great in the Royal Tenenbaums. But He's amazing I, in Tenenbaums. I think this was head over heels better than the, his role in the Royal Tenenbaums because mm-hmm. of everything that he was allowed to do or the character did at least. Right. Well, he was more of a secondary character in Tenenbaums. Yeah, but absolutely. I think I think that was the movie that um, that. Uh, that uh, Wes Anderson kind of fell in love with Bill Murray's uh, acting style. And I think that was the movie where he clicked with him and said, okay, I need to write something for Bill Murray because he said that this movie was always written. The part of Steve Zissou was always written for Bill Murray. It was never written. You know, they couldn't have made this movie without him. Oh, nice. And so, um, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let me take a step back here for a second, if I may. The first time you saw this and the first time anyone saw this, did anybody else think that Owen Wilson's jaw or bottom half of his face was a lot bigger than it was in real life? Like computer animated big? I never noticed that. Jeez, it must just be me. I mean, I know know Luke Wilson has a big jaw, so... I mean, they're brothers. (sighs) Luke Wilson has a very nice jawline, I'll give him that. Maybe it was the mustache that threw me off or whatnot, but yeah, boy, everything about that environment was I was must have been really looking close at that point. It was like, what am I look? Is he really looking? Did he have surgery on his jaw or something for this part? Yeah. Okay. So, so Owen Wilson plays uh, Ned Plimpton, and this is kind of a different character for Owen Wilson. He he has like this childlike innocence about him and he's he's our moral center for the movie um you know steve zisu is kind of the the world's uh biggest dirt bag and <laughs> owen wilson plays a character that could possibly be steve Z- zisu's son um but he you know he plays this this movie like this innocent guy that is just the sweetest guy you'd ever meet you know he he like i said is the moral center for the film um kate blanchett plays jane winslet richardson and uh she plays a she's a conflicted writer who's pregnant with her married editor's baby and she's yeah and the first scene where she shows up i was like Kind of seriously, Wes, like the hit the music, a little soft introduction to this character. Yeah, just had to put that out there. Please go on. And uh, so, Kate Blanchett, she's she's kind of uncertain about the direction of her life. You know, she's she's uh, she's somebody that, as a kid, used to idolize Steve Zissou, but the the shine is kind of worn off of him when she meets him and begins writing a cover story about him for a uh, magazine um angelica houston is uh eleanor zisu uh she plays steve's ex-wife who has also been romantically connected to his steve's nemesis alistair hennessy uh, <laughs> and she comes from wealth and provides a lot of money to fund the expositions of team zisu and she's also considered by many to be the brains behind Team Zisu, uh, that which is a description that Steve despises due to his ego, uh, and she plays she plays somewhat of a similar character caught between two loves in the Royal Tannenbaums. Um, you know, she's in that movie. She's kind of caught between Gene Hackman and Danny Glover. Um, in this one, it's Jeff Goldblum as Alistair Hennessy and Steve Zisu, Bill Murray, like we said. Um, but her, her turn in this is a little bit darker because she's kind of the, a big source of, uh, pain and a little bit of, uh, of an antagonist to our quote unquote hero, Steve Zissou. Mm, That's Uh, a very good assessment. And I feel very much the relationship between all of these characters. Yeah. You're unfolding them in such a different light. Well, and Goldblum plays Alistair Hennessy. Uh, this is probably, I mean, this this movie, like I said, you know, the actors really get to kind of 
play with every scene. Because his improv is horrible. That's what you're getting at, aren't you? No, I mean Goldblum. Goldblum goes full Goldblum in this movie. Yeah, um, he is great in this, and I know, love him. This is probably one of my favorite Goldblum roles, and is right up there with Thor Ragnarok uh, in terms of just the off the wall ridiculous gold bloominess gold bloom got a gold bloom gold bloom got a gold bloom gold bloom be blooming <laughs> so, so he, he is uh alistair hennessy is steve's professional and personal rival um and he's better funded and has uh garnered the romantic attention of steve's ex-wife angelica houston aka eleanor zisu uh next up we have willem dafoe Klaus Daimler, 40, engineer, calm, collected, German. <laughs> Willem, Willem Dafoe in this movie gives a master class on how to be a supporting actor who makes every single scene his own, but doesn't steal anything from the other actors. He really is a very, very strong backbone to this movie. Every scene that Willem Dafoe's in, you're like, Oh my God, he's freaking hilarious, but he doesn't steal from any of the other actors in the scenes. He, he almost benefits the other actors just because of how ridiculous he is. And when he's on screen, he brings everything he has to the character of Klaus and makes every other actor's performance that much better. Um, this is, yeah, who? I mean, who the shit is Kingsley Zisu? Who the shit is Kingsley Zisu? And I mean, he really does make every other actor's performance that much better, um, just because of the way he delivers his lines and and how he handles every scene. A um, couple of smaller roles: uh, Noah Taylor plays Vladimir Wolodarsky, um, and he's he's an actor who's played a lot of small parts in so many movies and shows. Um, in this, he's a, he's a loyal member of team Zisu who produces the soundtrack for their films, edits the narration and works in the Belafonte's laboratory. Um, one of my favorite scenes that he's in is when the walkie talkies aren't working and he just smashes them. And it's, <laughs> it's just, you know, he hits that, he hits the Wes Anderson deadpan tone out of the park as well. Um, Michael, I think it's his last name is pronounced Gambon or Gambon, G-A-M-B-O-N. I'm not sure, but he plays Osiri Draculius. I, I can't remember how you pronounce the, the character's name either, but he's a pretty famous British actor who portrayed Dumbledore in the Harry Potter series. He was the mm. second double door. And, I, and once I noticed that, it was pretty weird seeing him without the beard. And once I real, realized who he was. So jumping into the movie, this is very distinctly a Wes Anderson film. Um, the colors, the shots, the complex characters with multiple quirks and imperfections, the deadpan comedy, the music choices... And each of the actors just getting their chance to shine. Um, I think I think he's able to put together. Anderson's able to put together these ensemble casts because actors um, really like to work for him, work with him. Um, I think it, if I was an actor and I really wanted to kind of hone my craft and you know, develop characters that, that were kind of out there, this would be one of the top directors I'd want to work with. You know, you can understand why Jeff Goldblum and Bill Murray and, and Willem Dafoe would want to, um, would want to work with him. You know, he just, he seems like the type of guy that just lets people roll, um, with the dialogue and improv and, you know, have a little fun hey. with it get weird they get super weird and actors and actresses that want to get weird i mean heck i think kate blanchett hardly got weird in this movie and she was nominated for a whole crap load of crap when this thing came out yeah she was actually she i think i saw something that said that she was supposed to play a pregnant character but it turns out she was actually pregnant when she started playing it and so ah, yeah good worked point in her favor ah oh and even 
thinking about that, uh, my mentor, my mentor, Lord Mandrake, hmm. he's he's dead now. <laughs> I think that was whenever Zisu was going right through the introduction of everything, much like you're doing now, but yeah. with such a Wes Anderson spin on it. Right. So most of the humor in this movie, um, you know, it, it's kind of a, a comedy drama a little bit. Um, it's a very dry humor, but most of the humor comes from the the character creation, and it's not... It, it, it comes from the characters and their delivery of of their lines more so than um, more so than actual comedy, and it's not always what they say that that drives the comedy, but how they say it that gets a laugh. Um, you know, like Owen Wilson's first line is the "Yes, but what's next for Team Z Sue?" You know, it's not a it's it's not a movie that is. Um, you know, like that line when you see it is delivered by anyone else and in any other situation. Yes, what's next for Team Zisu is just a dry, straightforward line, but the way he delivers that line is comical. I mean, it's just, it's hilarious. It's one of those things that, you know, has to be seen to be understood. And that's a beautiful point, which is why this movie falls short for so many people. Right. And I don't, I don't really think a lot of people either open their hearts or open their minds to that sort of stuff because that's you know you know that's not a slapstick comedy type thing. That's something that you really gotta you have to be in the right mindset for. Yeah, and it's it's a film that it's a film that has several layers, and every scene has details in it. This is not something you can put on in the background and be playing on your phone. You know, you can't just sit there and play Candy Crush while you're watching this movie because every scene, even the short scenes, have um, so much detail in them. And those details always come up and come back. Um, you know, there's so many through lines and... and and things like that that are minor details that play into the bigger picture. Um, so if you don't pay attention to the little quirks of the characters or the little things that they say, you know, um, you miss a lot if you're not fully paying attention and fully invested in the movie. So, you know, if you watch this movie one time, you may not get everything that's in it. I think this is one of those movies that that almost requires multiple viewings to completely be able to consume it and ingest it. Um, I like whenever the scene, if whenever the whole uh, what's next for Team Zisu and then he talks about ah, maybe hunt it down and blow it up with dynamite or something yeah. about the shark and then he comes out. Of the movie premiere, and that heckler is like, "Hey, who are you gonna kill in the next one?" He goes and punches the guy in the face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, that makes me happy. So uh, right before we get to that scene, the movie starts out at the at the premiere of the famed but past his prime oceanographer Steve Zissou's uh, latest documentary, and in that film, uh, in the in the short you know trailer for that film, we get to see that that Steve's partner and mentor of over 27 years Esteban was eaten by a jaguar shark and during the even eating Steve shot it dorsally with a homing dart uh -huh. and so they they show Steve kind of popping up out of the water as it's full of blood and you know Klaus looks looks at the cameraman and says you know get him out of the fucking water and they have to pull Steve out of the water because he's got paranoid psychosis, the oh, crazy eyes, hydrogen psychosis. Oh, thank you. Oh, oh, that's a good one. Yeah, the crazy eye. And so after after they premiere the movie, um, they do a Q and A session, and Steve announces that his next film. He announces that this is the part one of their their latest series. And the next film will be about them hunting down the jaguar shark that they're tracking via the homing dart. 
And some people think that Steve is a phony and this is all just a publicity stunt. And he's Steve is obviously depressed at the loss of his friend and the people that don't believe him and kind of his his feelings towards his ex-wife. Um, and basically everything in his life sucks. And Bill Murray plays such a lovable dick. He is just a <laughs> he is just a contemptible prick. But he's strangely endearing, and he speaks... Um, it, he's an insufferable son of a bitch. He really is. And he speaks his mind in every situation, has absolutely no filter, and the viewer kind of assumes that at one point uh, he was a passionate man who had love, success, fame, and happiness. Um, but this is never explicitly shown. You kind of sympathize with him because he lost his best friend, his wife, and his funding. Um, well, even the beauty part about that of which you just mentioned is when he starts autographing all of those posters for that old man. Yeah. And then you're seeing this the history of this guy and what his – what he has been through and it's like oh my gosh steve zisu and island cats he's running with the freaking giant leopard type creature not leopard shark and it's like he's a seasoned vet of this wildlife game right and then he's like all right old man you can you can autograph the rest of them at home I've yeah had enough. it's and like bam he's just kind of you know washed up down on his luck and uh it's it's at this moment um you know one of the people at the q a um, asks him, you know, yes, what's next for Team Zisu? And that guy is Owen Wilson. Um, and come to find out, and a few a few scenes later, they're having a party on the uh, on the ship uh, on Steve Zisu's ship, the Belafonte, to celebrate their um, celebrate their uh, premiere of the movie. And that guy shows up. And tells him that he may be Steve Zissou's son. Um, and so Steve basically decides he has nothing to lose. And with or without the funding, he decides he is going to seek revenge on the Jaguar shark that killed Esteban, whether the movie gets made or not. And what's the line he says? Uh, I'm going to go on an overnight drunk and in the morning ten, I'm going to... Ten hour drunk. Ten hours to be exact. Yeah, I'm gonna find the the shark that killed my best friend and kill it. And, and then the uh, lights shut off. Yeah, and, and the, the power set. The power is always going out on the boat. So he doesn't know what else to do or how else to be. So he's just plowing forward with with what he knows, you know. And during the adventure, he he's trying to connect with his estranged, his possibly estranged son, his ex wife. Uh, he's trying to, you know, reconcile with his public persona and find himself and who he really is. Um, so I still like to go back to when he makes that de declaration of hunting the shark and then it gets all really somber and then the lights go out and it's like, holy shit. Maybe yeah. I'm looking at that a little too much, but that was like a turning point for the movie. At least no, I think that's, I think that's a great point. I love that he goes on a 10 hour drunk too, because the hijinks that ensue after that are even just as good. I, you know me, I love hijinks. So uh, Ned, <laughs> Ned introduces himself and tells Steve that his mother was Catherine Plimpton, one of Steve's former lovers. So that once he says, you know, my mother was Catherine Plimpton, uh, that kind of strikes a nerve with Steve and, he also tells Ned also tells Steve that he was a member of the Zisu society since he was 11 and wrote Steve a fan letter when he was, when he was a little boy. And now he is a pilot for air Kentucky. Sorry. I'm <laughs> going to, I'm going to keep doing the Ned Plimpton voice throughout this whole well, review because that's I great. absolutely love it. Please do. And <laughs> I would like to also do impersonations and I strongly feel like we should do more impersonations or impressions <laughs> of any and all characters from any discussions that we have. So proceed. So at this point, uh, Steve introduces us to his boat, the Belafonte, um, in, in like a, a narration scene where we get a, um, 
a bisection of the actual ship. And, oh, that's and, so great because they built that whole thing. Oh. Yeah, and it's it's wow. actually like a um, it's almost the whole movie is shot in in the style of of almost like a um, a children's book. Thank you. You just you took know, the words right out of my mouth. It's it's very it's very detailed and it's very interesting to look at. Almost like a Where's Waldo book when you look at the when you look at the pictures of the people in the Where's Waldo books. You know, you always could find funny things happening in the background or interesting things to look at, but you didn't you know there was so much to take in in every shot and every scene just so many details and intricacies that uh that anderson throws in there just just because he's such an eccentric director um so we get to see the belafonte and steve gives us a little tour of the sauna the laboratory the kitchen the library, the recording studio, the observation bubble, the engine room, which we find out, you know, is is kind of in disarray. Uh, the helicopter, the trained dolphins that swim alongside the sub, which Steve has a vendetta <laughs> against. Uh, the mini sub, uh, which is now called Deep Search, but used to be called Jacqueline after his first wife. And Ned asks him, what happened to Jacqueline? Because the name on the ship is crossed out. And Steve just kind of deadpan answers, it turns out she didn't love me. And it's just such a, a weird detail to put in there uh, because it's never really touched on again. You know, Super just, weird detail. It just builds I, the character. It builds the character. And I feel like when people watch that, they expected that to be funny. Yeah. And they were probably torn, like, should I be laughing at that? Is that supposed to be funny? And yeah. that's why they're like, mate, you know what? The kids can have this movie. Maybe I'm just too old. Well, yeah. get over yourself. And the humor, the humor in this movie is almost like a British humor in the way that it's delivered because it's so dry. You know, this mm. is like a Canada dry <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's a, uh, it's a very wh- cultural, that's yeah. very cultural of it's, an observation. It's like a Chianti, you know, it gets, it gets better <laughs> with age, but it is very dry. Um, so Steve continues to struggle with the notion of having an adult son. And at one point, um, tells, tells Ned that I would have named you Kingsley as opposed to Ned. Um, which in itself is just a really weird scene. Um, and isn't that the name of the dog in Royal Tenenbaums? The dog? Yeah. Ben what? Stiller's son's dog's name is Kingsley. Is it really? Yeah. I didn't, I know. Are you sure about that? I am positive because I know this because I've watched a billion times and have spoken about it to other such fanatics. I remember when the, when the dog gets run over in that movie. And Owen Wilson, where's my shoe? Um, but anyways, you know, this movie, I, I couldn't find any resources on this, but it's it's kind of my impression that there was a lot of improv by Defoe and Murray and Goldblum and Wilson. And Murray and Wilson, um, during the I would have named you Kingsley scene, both of them start to crack up a little bit. And I think Bill Murray, um, I think Bill Murray threw that in there because you can see Wilson starts to Owen Wilson starts to crack a little bit and smiles real big while delivering his next line. And and Murray has a little bit of a smile on his face like he's also getting ready to break. And I think they caught a good um, a good a take. good moment. Yeah, yeah, because that really is that that scene right there really kind of highlights the humor a little bit because if I sit here and say that I would have named you Kingsley, you know, it's not that funny. But if you okay. watch that scene and you watch the actors and kind of what's going on, it it's almost like watching a Saturday night live sketch where the actors begin to break a little bit, you know, and you start to get in on the on the joke a little bit more. I think it's adorable. And to, to correct myself, the dog's name was Buckley, not Kingsley. Buckley. So. My bad. 
But yeah, I, I, at first I'm thinking, okay, maybe they're actually laughing, but the, I do also think that maybe they took that scene a few times and broke, broke laughing in one or two of them, and maybe that was just really good acting. So I'm flip-flopping back on what you said and what quite possibly could be very endearing of an act. Right. So, so Steve, um, Steve and Ned here, uh, some people talking about and over here, some people in, in Portuguese over talking about, uh, talking about him in a bar and how dumb he looks, how dumb Steve looks with his earring. They're like, you know, <laughs> what's with the earring? You know, what a, what a freak, you know, all this stuff. And, you know, they <laughs> on my cousin at her like 16th birthday party or something. <laughs> And so they don't realize that that uh, Steve kind of understands Portuguese a bit and he goes outside and he's sitting there drunk and he uh, he takes his earring out and he throws it. And without missing a beat, Owen Wilson gets up and goes and retrieves it. And Steve is just kind of sitting there with his hand out and Owen Wilson comes over and put it back, puts it back in his hand. Again, a scene that describing it nowhere near as fruitful as actually watching the actors and how they play this scene. You know, it's a, it's a distinctly Bill Murray scene. You know, it has that, that Murray oddness and charm, you know? And that's a good one because that actually, and there was subtitles and that actually took me a couple of times, not a few times to really get that entire scene and, and like it as much as I do right now. Right. So I can understand if people are going to continue to shit on certain scenes like that because, okay, I didn't get it the first time. Where's my explosion, Michael Bay? Right. Keep me entertained. So he gets to um, he gets to his wife Eleanor or his ex wife Eleanor's island, and Angelica Houston rolls up and tells him his cat died, and he asks him or she asks. He asks her how the cat died, and she tells him from a rattlesnake bite. <laughs> bit him in the throat, of all yeah, places. A rattlesnake bit him in the throat. And so... Oh, his cat's name was Marmalade. I mean, <laughs> who does not like a fruit spread based on citrus fruits? I, <laughs> Paddington loves them. <laughs> oh, that is so good. I love that. So, you know, we see Angelica Houston being like this passive aggressive bitch and Steve kind of calls her out for this. Um, <laughs> and so at, at one point, um, Ned gets called via a uh, an <laughs> intercom or something to to get down to the beach because they have found a, um, they need to start filming because there's a, a bunch of, uh, what is it, nighttime jellyfish or glowing jellyfish or something like that. And uh, so he runs down there to kind of help out with the filming. Um, you know, it's just a coincidence that they came across them. And Ned's holding the boom mic. And uh, he he does a good ad lib. Um, he, he asks... Um, he asked Steve what produces the glowing of the uh, of the jellyfish, and Steve answers him back and realizes, wow, this guy could could really add something to our production. So he tells him, you know, Team Z sues a pack of strays, and he begins to realize that this aspect of his life would be a great subplot for his film. You know, he could use Ned and his relationship building as a subplot for his documentary. Um, kind of showing the humanization of Zisu during the whole film. And uh, Klaus, Willem Dafoe, gets gets really jealous of Ned for being the focus of, of Steve's attention. Um, it's at this point that Kate Winslet playing Jane shows up and Zisu <laughs> says the line, Who are you? You look pregnant. And so she's, she's writing an arc, article about Zisu um, and she's, you know, a couple of her little quirks is she doesn't swear and she likes to read aloud to her baby. Uh, one night Ned hears her reading, uh, aloud to the baby and asks if he can sit down and listen to the story. And Ned gets himself a, uh, they get, they, 
they show us the uh, the Team Zisu uniform, basically a a baby blue jumpsuit with uh, with uh, shoes, uh, Adidas shoes, a uh, red beanie hat, and you know that and Glocks. Everybody gets a Glock. The interns get a Glock. No, they have to share one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that makes me happy. <laughs> so Jane starts interviewing Zisu and she calls him a fake. And her line of questioning pisses him off because it's kind of hard hitting and not really the puff piece he thought it would be. So it upsets Steve. <laughs> and he pulls, a, he pulls a gun on her and, and says, does this look fake? And he tells her <laughs> that she's a fake. And this upsets her. I'm pretty sure he calls her a bull dyke at some level or another. He does. He does. We kind of get to that. He doesn't say it to her face. Um, So Klaus, uh, being upset that Ned is stealing all the attention, slaps him, slaps Ned and warns him to mind his step and know his place. And he keeps referring to him as Sonny. Sonny. Sonny boy. So Steve tells Ned not to tell Jane anything. Zisu calls her a bull dyke because she doesn't like him. Mm-hmm. He, he kind of has uh, feelings to, toward her, but, you know, she's indifferent. Uh, Ned asks Steve uh, when he first knew about Ned being possibly being his child. And Steve said he knew about him about five years ago, but he says he didn't call because he hates fathers and he never wanted to be one. So that kind of gives us a little bit of insight into Zisu and his own history without explicitly saying that, you know, he had a tumultuous, tumultuous relationship with his own dad, you know, or possibly another type father figure type. You know, it's kind of an ambiguous statement, but it really, you know, builds that character out even more, you know, showing kind of the the shipwreck that is his life. Mm. Um very well said. So Jane calls her editor and baby daddy and leaves him a message that she's going to have the baby and she doesn't want anything to do with him. Uh, meanwhile, Steve gives Ned a Glock and his team Zisu outfit. Uh, when they're looking for funding, Ned offers up the uh, $275,000 from his mother's life insurance policy to help secure that funding. And Steve has to agree to certain terms from the bond company, including drug screenings, a bond company stooge, quote unquote, a.k.a. Billy, uh, has to go with them. They're not allowed to kill the shark, uh, to which Zisu replies, I'll fight it, but I won't kill it. Where's my dynamite? Where's my dynamite? At this point, um, it's there's a scene where where all the members of Team Zisu are packed together in an elevator. And Zisu, in order to kind of rally the troops, tells them, let's have some teamsmanship. And puts his hand, <laughs> they all put their hands in. And instead of doing like a one, two, three, Zisu, or something like that, it's just they all put their hands in and go, ho! <laughs> let's have some teamsmanship. Ho! So there's um, there's a montage of the Belafonte preparing to set sail and shoot the film uh, and them training on the beach. Uh, Steve sees Ned sharing a moment with Jane. Uh, Ned drowns in a swimming pool and Steve gives him CPR and they kind of record the whole thing for the film. Um, so, you know, they they never like to miss a moment of of the doc of what could possibly create drama for the documentary um i think it's at this point that ned kind of starts to realize that he's a character in a film and might be being used a little bit by his possible father so the crew is watching watching an old zisu documentary as steve is they don't know it but steve is kind of standing in the background and klaus reflects to the group that's what he used to be like. And Steve hears that and realizes that even his crew thinks he's washed up. So, um, bomber. Yeah. So all the Zisu films that they show, like the documentaries that they show and, and, and little cutaways and, and, uh, and scenes like this, all the Zisu films seem to, um, uh, be parodies or homages to, 
the nature documentaries and educational films like uh, you'd see on PBS or films that were shown in schools in the 60s and 70s, um, probably during Wes Anderson's time, you know, this might be something that would come out on a projector that they would show during schools for biology classes or science classes. Um, yeah, good good call with the projector. That's definitely the feeling that I got. Yeah, they're they're definitely not shot. I think these those scenes are probably shot on um like what is it, eight millimeter film or something like that to kind of give them that grainy uh that grainy look. Um so Steve kind of feels bad for how he's treated Jane a little bit and he takes her up in the hot air balloon and he tries to kiss her, but she rejects him. Um, he's clearly not used to being rejected by women. And it's at this point, Jane takes a big swig of Steve's alcoholic beverage and you know, she's pregnant and he tells her she's a bad mother and then lights a joint off of the, <laughs> lights a joint off of the, uh, the hot air balloon, <laughs> the hot air balloon. So <laughs> Steve's taking a look at the, uh, at the dolphins to see how they're doing, uh, what they uh, what the dolphins are able to pick up on the film and stuff. And he delivers a line of son of a bitch. I'm sick of these dolphins. <laughs> so Steve, <laughs> Steve kind of has like a, uh, a pretty hateful relationship with the doll with the dolphins. Um, you can kind of feel like this is something that, that he thought would be a cool purchase, but it hasn't quite panned out. But he has these two albino dolphins with cameras rigged up to him that are supposed to be filming at all times. But, you know, they're they're a lot dumber than they were, and they were probably sold to him. Um, you know, somebody probably swindled him when they sold him to him because they're not really trained uh, as much as you would think they would be. I, I love that portion of the movie that they have. Something that almost borderline sci-fi of dolphins with cameras on the head. Yeah. Yet we get no exploitation or explanation for anything further from his his animosity towards them. Yeah. It's you, beautiful. You remember that show um, Sequest? Oh my gosh. I completely forgot last Friday was the Ander Jonathan Brandis' birthday. Jonathan Brandis. May he rest in peace. I idolized that man. Yeah. I used to love that show. I can't really remember too much about it other than he kind of like worked with dolphins or something. Hell yeah. That's a they were under, they were making a whole bunch of different type of underwater craft. It that's was like, that's my next. Before Octonauts were Octonauts. <laughs> it's the grown-up version of Octonauts. Uh, but anyways, happy birthday to the late, great Jonathan Brandis. May he rest in peace. God rest his soul, as we like to say on this show. Amen. So um, Ned Ned goes up to Steve and asks, asks him if he can update the Zisu insignia, to which Ned... Or to which Steve tells him, you know, go nuts, you know, make it, make something new, update it, you know, bring it into the 21st century. So Steve asks Ned if he's found what he's looking for uh, by coming with them on this trip. And Ned kind of responds by asking him if he ever got the fan letter from when that he sent Steve when he was a boy. Um, and so... Steve or Ned kind of narrates the letter for the audience and reads uh, reads the res or kind of reflects on the letter and and reads the or Steve reads the response back to Ned. So so Ned is reading what I'm sorry. Steve is reading what Ned got in the mail from Steve. Right. Yes. So they uh, they come across uh, o Operation Hennessy's outpost. Uh, oh, that's great! This is great. And they they break in and decide that they're going to rob the place. And while they're robbing it, they uh, they use the technology to track the jaguar shark. And they start stealing everything, including the cappuccino machines 
and and uh, every everything on board basically and so they're tracking the shark through unprotected waters where there are pirates uh it's at this point you start to see how the interns are all treated like shit and it's part of a through line that goes through the whole movie you know the interns have to share a glock um when they're stealing the cappuccino (laughs) machine zisu (laughs) hand it hands it to one of the interns and says hook this up and make me a latte um, when he breaks a door on the ship, he, t- he says that he's going to get the interns to fix it. And it's funny cause one of the interns, the, the curly haired, like white kid with like an Afro is actually, uh, Wes Anderson's real life assistant. So, <laughs> so Ned shows Steve up in front of Jane at one point by pointing out some information that he doesn't know, um, and kind of makes him look like a fool. Uh, and so Steve goes to him and asks him not to, you know, he's basically saying, Hey, you know, if you've got any ideas or, you know, you want to speak up in front of the crew or in front of Jane, why don't you run it by me first instead of, uh, instead of stealing my thunder. Um, so there's a, uh, uh, another good scene in the sauna, uh, in the hot tub and every time you see a scene in the sauna, somebody is wearing a very small Speedo, which is almost like a, a Will Ferrell-esque scene, um, you know, where where somebody who is unfit, like Bill Murray, is just, you know, overly proud of their body. Um, <laughs> you know, it's very, very much like a Will Ferrell type of comedic scene. Um so Steve breaks into Jane's room and he reads uh, the first draft of her article and realizes that the article does not paint him in a fair, favorable light and he confronts her about it. She's pissed he broke into the room and he tells her he'll have the interns come fix the door. Um, Jeff Goldblum, Alistair Hennessy, uh, finds out that he's been robbed and decides to hunt down the robbers. <laughs> uh, some crooked fuckers broke into your sea lab <laughs> so uh, so they decide uh are they're getting ready they're filming a scene for before they take a dive on the airplane wreck and they pipe in some music instead of <laughs> instead of using uh instead of using the radios and their helmets their dive helmets strictly for uh communications they decide to they also have music piped into it so they can kind of dive to the music um and the music is supposed to supposedly written by Wolodarsky, who composes all the music for the film but it's actually mark mothersbaugh and and like this devo-esque beat that's playing in the background um so as they're down doing this dive under the airplane wreck Ned asks him if he can call him dad in the underwater scene. Steve says no, and he offers up Stevesy as some some sort of nickname to show that he looks up to him, but dad is too personal. So um, Steve narrates the scene, and uh, after this scene, Ned is a little pent up and decides that he's going to slap Klaus back. Uh, and just walks up to Klaus and slaps him in the face. So after that, Jane and Ned share a kiss, and Ned tells her that Steve has kind of has a thing for her. Uh, the dolphin camera shows them record or records them um, moving further than the kiss, and they start having sex. And Steve sees them on the monitor, and. Hmm. Uh, Those dolphins have paid off. The dolphins have paid off. So Steve's in the sauna in a Speedo. And (laughs) it's at that point that uh, pirates pull up behind the Belafonte and hijack the ship while Ned was supposed to be on watch, but he was having sex with Jane. Um, And the pirates take Ned. So Steve, this is the point where Steve has realizes he has something to lose. His crew's in danger. He makes sure the camera is still recording because he wants, you know, his ego is so inflated that he wants the camera to catch what he's about to do. The Bond Company stooge, Billy and Ned, are both taken. 
and uh, along with the ship's vault, which contains several different types of currencies. So Steve loses his shit to an Ig- to the Iggy and the Pop uh, Iggy and the Stooges search and destroy song, and he does this to save Ned and his crew. So Steve is basically tied up, blindfolded. He's in a bathrobe and a speedo, and he's basically like fuck it and chews off his bindings that are tied around his wrist, steals a gun from one of the pirates, and goes into full-on, like, die-hard mode. And they throw a grenade on the Belafonte while they're fleeing from Steve, who is just basically shooting everything he can see. And he actually does end up killing one of the pirates. And uh, he, he, he remarks to himself that he's impressed by the Bond Company's stooge's bravery by saying i never saw a bond company stooge stick out his neck like that and so so, that's pretty good and also what i read was somebody had commented about the violence in this movie was a little bit much and it might be in reference to that scene and possibly the scene when they rescue jeff goldblum's character at the end which is hilarious yeah it is it is like completely ridiculous it's one of my top tens favorite scenes of the whole movie but yeah i think when you're a movie like this the subject matter the type of, and i given given it's a wes anderson movie but i think that if you're in that world you're gonna do a, a little bit of pirates whenever they go off course because it was like four inches to get in the safe waters and then it was like an inch and a half to get through the unprotected waters right and of course zisu didn't want to pay for the gas <laughs> He is a cheap bastard. So I, I welcome the violence as it is a, it's an extreme portion of the film, but it's something that keeps you on your toes. Well, and it, it shows that because of his stubbornness, there's, there's consequences for that. You know, his crew, nice. um, as we see in the next couple of scenes, uh, his crew ends up having conflict about what a bastard he is and, and how he's led them into danger and everything. So the pirates, uh, they end up leaving behind this three-legged dog. Doesn't one of the interns take like a machete down the shoulder too? Um, I can't remember. Oh my gosh, I remember that graphic scene was like, whoa, they really did it. They, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Wes. I didn't know this was a Friday the 13th film, but thank you. Whoops. Yeah, quite possibly. I may have missed that. But Okay, uh, so Cody, the three-legged dog. They lost. They left their fucking dog, those, <laughs> those amateurs. Yeah, that's the line. They left their fucking dog, amateurs. Oh, so, that is, that's like amazing. how many times has he run into pirates that he's calling these ones amateurs? Like he's seen professional pirates. <laughs> like this is not. This is like just a fucking Tuesday for Zisu. Oh, that's great! I love that dog. So they decide. Um, they come across the. Uh, there's a dead pirate on their ship deck, and they decide to bury him at sea. And Klaus says, I'll write up a few words. So they're going to eulogize this pirate that tried to kill them moments ago. And just as their Klaus is reading the eulogy about the pirate, they're all standing around mourning the death of this pirate. And all of a sudden we hear, murp, murp. <laughs> and Murray turns. The camera kind of pans over and Murray goes, son of a bitch, dump him over the other side. <laughs> and it's <laughs> Jeff Goldblum's boat. He shows up during the funeral. They never hear him or see him, even though he's in this giant ship that sneaks up directly behind them. So Murray and Goldblum share this scene. um, And (laughs) uh, the dog, uh, the three-legged dog is with Murray, and he's kind of whining the whole time that they're talking. And uh, probably one of my favorite lines in the movie is Goldblum says to Murray, What's the dog's name? Murray pauses for a good 10 seconds and just says, Cody. And then Goldblum gets up, walks over to the dog, rolls up a a thing of paper in his hand and slaps the dog across the face and points at him and says, be still, Cody. (laughs) Which (laughs) I, you know, jokingly do that, you know, to people and, and, and my dog basically all the time. Um, 
in a lighthearted fashion. In a lighthearted fashion. We do not encourage violence, especially towards dogs or any animals. Yeah, just people. (laughs) (laughs) Pirates. Pirates, especially. Fucking amateurs. Johnny Depp. (laughs) Be still, Johnny. So um, there's there's a mutiny ab- among the crew because Steve has led them into the pirate's water and Ned and, and Billy, the Bond Company stooge, have been captured. Steve asks them who is going to quit and asks them to step forward. And uh, Klaus doesn't understand the instructions on whether he's supposed to step forward if he's wanting <laughs> to quit or if he's wanting to stay. And he's like, do it over again. I'm not, I messed up. Uh, yeah, that would confuse anyone. He's like, cross the... I don't even know what the... Cross the something. Anyways, go on, please. So Kate calls her editor and tells him that she's moving on without him. And Ned gives her a self a package of self-addressed envelope, envelopes so that she can write to him. And Steve tells her that she just missed the mass quitting of interns and the script girl. So... She tells him that he's not writing the story, or she's not writing the story on Steve anymore. And Steve asks her if she's sleeping with Ned. He tells her she shouldn't leave because she's going to miss them hunting the jaguar shark. Uh, And Steve tells all the interns that that quit that they're getting incompletes. (laughs) So so Steve Steve goes to Eleanor who is staying at Alistair Hennessy, Jeff Goldblum's place. Um, and he catches Ned and Jane during an intimate moment. But Steve thought, uh, Steve thought Jane had left, but she tells him that his speech basically convinced her to stay. And Steve is upset because he had a thing for Jane. Uh, Ned tells Steve that his documentary is fake and he's just a character in it. He feels like he's being used <laughs> and they have a really awkward fight where both of them basically punch each other in the face, face once or twice. And uh, Steve is just kind of a prick to Ned and Jane after this. So Ned reveals to Steve that he knew about him from the day he was born. That Steve knew about Ned from the day he was born. Because his mother told him before she died that Steve has known about Ned since he was born. Eleanor shows up with money and a phone message from the Bond stooge, and he admits Eleanor is the brains behind the team. So things start to turn up for Steve. You know, he his ex-wife is basically getting on his good side. You know, him and Ned are beginning to reconcile a little bit after, after their little tryst. And, um... It's at this point that they come across Hennessy's plundered ship and realize that he's been picked up by the pirates who took Ned and the Bond Company stooge. So they find out from uh, from uh, the message that was left on Eleanor's phone that the pirates are at an old hotel hit by a typhoon on Ping Island. Team Zisu invades the island and... Uh, and Zisu makes Klaus B squad leader and Klaus is a little upset that he's B squad and Steve tells him look you were always a baby brother to to Steve and Esteban and this really Klaus is really touched by this so this is the hotel where Steve and his first wife Jacqueline spent their honeymoon but now it's basically in ruins Steve tells Ned that instead of calling him Stevesy, Ned can now call him Papa Steve. <laughs> he's one of his one of his other deadpan lines that he delivers is he says to, says to Ned, "I'm sorry that I never acknowledged your existence all those years. It won't happen again." <laughs> and Steve tells Ned that he loves him in his own special way, and they kind of reconcile. Uh. Klaus finds the uh, the Bond Company stooge, and they see the graves of Hennessy's guys. Cody finds the pirates, and Steve gets into a shootout with them after they shoot Hennessy, uh, who's wearing a I'm a Pepper shirt. 
<laughs> Steve, is, are you here to rescue me? <laughs> this I is, fold. <laughs> this is the uh, the Klaus bring the dynamite scene where uh, Klaus and, and uh, Ned run into the building, but the rest of the crew kind of stands there awkwardly, and the camera doesn't show any of the shootout. You just kind of hear it off screen, um, and they just run off all together uh, after the shootout. So you basically just see the crew standing there while you hear the gunshots of, of Ned and Steve and, uh, and uh, Klaus but the rest of the crew is just standing there um, like not wanting to get involved. And then as Klaus, Ned and Steve run out of the building, they all run off towards the Belafonte. Um, Steve goes to shoot this kid and, uh, and uh, Billy, the bond company stooge says, no, that's Cedric. He's, he's a friend. And so Steve remarks, we'll get him a red cap and a speedo. <laughs> Merci Cedric. Merci Cedric. So they find the vault um and as they're fleeing and it has had the back blown out of it and it's empty and they leave Cody the dog. Uh Steve initially wants them to turn around and head back for Cody, but the crew <laughs> the crew just kind of looks at him like he's crazy and he's like au revoir Kurt, Cody. Uh, so that's nice. So they get away from the pirates and node, node, Ned shows them the new Team Zisu logo and suggests they go up in the helicopter to look for the Jaguar shark that they're tracking pretty close by. Uh, Ned gets a letter from Jane before he, while he's getting ready to, uh, or while he's putting on his jumpsuit and everything to get ready to board the helicopter and pilot it. And Klaus is so happy to be stitched onto the insignia on on the dolphin specifically on Ned's uh, new Zisu team Zisu insignia that he can't express himself in words. And Steve shows Ned that he kept the letter that he sent him when he was a kid. And he, he reads that letter aloud. Um, while they're up in the helicopter, they see a school of fluorescent snapper like he and Esteban saw just before he was eaten by the Jaguar shark. The helicopter crashes and, Ned dies, but Steve lives. So we don't really know that Ned is dying because Steve swims towards him and Ned is kind of holding on to a piece of debris and floating there. And we don't really know that he's dying until we get subtle shots of blood in the water. And Anderson kind of shows us that he's the master of subtle suggestion without, uh, without saying the words explicitly. So Ned is buried at sea and he's wrapped in the new insignia flag he's made. And Eleanor is really upset and she cries for the loss of him. Hennessy recognizes his espresso machine and realizes that he was robbed. So, oh, I love that. It's like, we stole it, man. <laughs> so they, they, re- they, they find the jaguar shark and Steve invites everyone into the mini sub as, they dive to, as he dives down to kill the jaguar shark. And he puts in a tape of Wolodarsky's, uh, he puts in a tape that's labeled Ned's theme that was written by Wolodarsky. As oh, they, that's a heartwarming song when the jaguar shark shows up. Yeah, it really is. And as they dive, um, the shark shows up and it's like this really iridescent, beautiful, uh, it, it's actually a puppet. And it's, um, Steve has kind of discovered this new species and at this point, everybody realizes that he's not a fraud or a phony. He didn't make up the story about Esteban being eaten by a jaguar shark. And he's he's discovered this new species. You know, he really is like the man that he wanted to be, you know, this this uh, oceanographer of legend. And he's kind of made peace with everyone that he cares about on the mini sub. And he begins to cry. Um. He starts weeping and kind of everybody understands this emotional moment. And he uses a sub, which is ironically kind of named, it's named Deep Search on a journey to find himself and prove himself and realize that he is remembered and that his legacy lives on. You know, he, his only line when he sees the shark is, you know, he kind of realizes the, 
magnitude of this of this moment and everything and he just looks at the shark and says i wonder if it remembers me you know and basically saying you know my legacy is that of a complete bastard but i want to be remembered you know and and it's at this moment that everyone kind of realizes that no matter how fucked up it can be, life is a beautiful, wonderful, precious thing. And Steve realizes what really matters in life. It's not the fame, rewards, riches, or adventure. It's the people. It's our family. Not just the blood relatives, but the family that we choose as well. And so after the dive, he gives Klaus's nephew, Werner, uh, Ned's Zisu society ring and Zisu looks into the camera and says this is an adventure and that's the last line of the movie basically meaning that life is an adventure and he carries Werner off on his shoulders showing us that we should treasure and enjoy each other and enjoy the ride of life no matter how crazy it gets you know so this whole movie was basically this giant collage of fucked up weirdness like the tagline says the deeper you go the weirder it gets but it shows us you know kind of the the beautiful strangeness of life and what a roller coaster it can be so team zisu happily rides again aboard the belafonte and they push onward um you know and we're, we're kind of left with this question of is ned steve's real son but you realize that it doesn't matter whether they were connected by blood or not. He's still a part of Team Zisu. And, you know, even Hennessy at this point is a, is a part of Team Zisu. And that's kind of what I take away from the movie. Heck yes. Profoundly so. And very well said. That's definitely... You're tugging at the heartstrings at that point. Right. Well, Mitchell, I'm going to go on a rant. Okay, let's hear it. This is when it really gets into the nitty-gritty of things. First, you've heard the facts and the summary. Now, let's really dive into what grinds Justin's gears. So this is a movie that is, like I said, made up of details and montages. This is not a movie that we can... It, it, frankly, it's not a movie that's easy to... Uh, describe to people because there's so much in it and there's so much to take away from it in terms of the way Anderson builds this world. And he really has an eye for details and his movies are distinctly in his style. Like you can look at a Wes Anderson movie much like you can look at a Tim Burton movie and they're easy to recognize. You know, he, he has this style that's distinctly his own. He paints every scene with detail of a children's book and it's like in the mercer mare little critter books where you know there's a mouse on every page or a, uh the cricket that's on every page you know there's stuff in the background nice. going on more so than the story that's being read to you um you know there's more going on in each scene than the dialogue or the action you know there's so much in the backgrounds and Anderson puts these odd little details in every line, every shot, every piece of dialogue. And there's so much movie and so much imagination just packed into every scene. And if you don't watch his films multiple times or pay attention fully, you miss so much of a Wes Anderson movie. This is not a passive viewing experience. None of his films are. They command your attention to get the entire story because there's so much story in every single detail. All the animals in this movie, for example, are sugar crabs, jaguar sharks, um, Vietnamese man of war, whatever they're called. <laughs> uh, just imaginative creations that make the movie feel purposefully disconnected from the world of reality and they make it feel otherworldly his comedy is like dark deadpan dramatic with dialogue reminiscent of like a pbs documentary from the 70s or 80s with a strange and often inexplicable back and forth between the characters like when goldblum says he's part gay like it just comes out of nowhere. Goldblum just says, you know, I'm part gay. 
<laughs> it's just completely like where does that come from? So a lot of the dialogue, Anderson gives the actors some freedom to kind of improvise. Um, it's almost like he says, this is what we're trying to accomplish with this scene. Um, pull this off and throws it at the actors without really writing the dialogue. He just kind of gives them an outline of the scene and gives them the freedom to, to work. And the actors, um, they really shine. You know, Anderson's movies kind of ride or die based off of the actors that he has. And luckily, the actors really seem to enjoy working with him. Every one of his movies has an all-star cast. You know, if you look up his filmography and look at all the actors in his movies, it's like you have like, you know, between 10 and 15 actors that are completely recognizable Hollywood standouts. Um, you know, and, and I think, like I said, this is not a movie you can you can watch once and write a review of. This movie demands multiple viewings and your full attention, just like every other Wes Anderson movie. End mm -hmm. rant. Here, here. Well yeah, yeah. done. That is pretty good. And I completely agree with you. The universe created by this movie was extremely beautiful, and it was something that I myself told my inner child, hey, you know what? Someday you're going to have one of those jumpsuits. Hey, those Adidas shoes may cost $6,000, but you know what? You save up enough milk money, you'll get one. Remember to go to patreon.com slash next level nerd so we can buy those damn shoes. Heck, someday. Who knows? Who cares? Someday. Whatever. It's definitely a movie that deserves a watch over and over and over. And you know what? I, really, I don't even think my wife has ever watched that, but I'm very interested to see what she thinks of it you know it's a it's almost like a children's movie for adults um That's you know exactly what it is because of it has this innocent quality to it um especially by uh the character of ned plimpton um you know like i said he's kind of our moral center he's the he's the hero of the children's book but you know it has this sadness about it as well you know ned dies in the movie um but Zisu is ultimately, quote unquote, our hero. And it has almost a little bit of a, a tinge of the darkness of a Tim Burton movie where it's kind of got that quirky, um, that quirky oddness to it. Um, it's not as over the top as most modern Tim Burton movies, but great point. And that quirky oddness can turn off someone <laughs> real quick but it could also turn people on real quick right and it i the one of the things that always got me with that i haven't even and this is well beyond the movie at this point is that the movie stowe foundation had absolutely zero to do with this film and i never really fully researched that to figure out what in the hell i mean it's the similarities to Jacques Cousteau, Steve Zissou, and such are, I mean, obviously they didn't really delve into how much, um, I would have gotten seasick by day one. I'm thinking the, the water would have been a little bit more rougher than that. Right. Well, just a few little uh, pieces of trivia here before we conclude this episode. Um, at 50, This is all from IMDb, by the way. At $50 million, this was Wes Anderson's biggest budgeted film, which failed to make very much money, earning back only $34.8 million worldwide. Mm -hmm. However, however um, you know, on, in my opinion, um, this movie is kind of a, a cult status film. You know, um, I think that the Rotten Tomatoes score reflects the overall divisiveness of the movie. Um, mm -hmm. And once again, from IMDb, there's a quote here that says, though most initial critical review, or excuse me, Quote, though most initial reviews were negative, critics can't seem to agree on the life aquatic. Even Rotten Tomatoes critics' consensus doesn't reach a consensus. The a life aquatic with Steve Zissou is getting soaked by many critics who call it smug, ironic, and artificial, as if that were an insult, insult instead of a plot point. Still, others have praised the movie's sheer uniqueness 
ex eccentricity and whimsy. Critic Matt Zoller Seats explained this by calling the movie an immense yet clearly personal as immense yet clearly personal as Jacques Taiti's Playtime, Steven Spielberg's 1941, Martin Scorsese's New York, New York, and Francis Ford Coppola's One from the Heart. All box office flops whose reputations grew with time. I think that's a good point. You know, it's mm -hmm. basically saying that, you know, sometimes a director makes a movie that it, the audience really isn't in on it. But over time, in on the joke or in on the the experience of the film, you know, this might be a film that's a little bit ahead of its time. You know, another example I think is is uh, you know, like we had talked about before, one of our favorite movies, Last Action Hero. You know, that's a movie that has, as time goes on, to me at least, it gets better and better. It's like a fine wine, you know. And yes. I think I think The Life Aquatic is one of those movies. It's it's completely rewatchable. In fact, it demands a rewatch. Um, totally demands a rewatch. And if you don't like it at first or the second time, then maybe watch it a third time or a fourth time. But really, if yeah. to, um, unless you really just have a heart of stone, then just be done with it. Right. And I mean, that's one of the things, too, is like if you're the type of person like, like Mitchell and I, um, we both usually watch a movie more than one time. You know, there's very few films that I've ever just seen once. You know, it has to be really, really bad for me to just watch it once. You know, even the movie Man of Steel, uh, the Superman movie, I hated that movie when it first came out, but I really loved this stuff on Krypton. And I hated it and hated it and bad-mouthed it to people. And the more and more and more I watched it, I finally was like, Oh, this makes sense in universe. I get it now. Yeah, it's not exactly the Richard Donner cut of Superman 2, but it's its own thing. I understand the draw. I'm actually glad you brought that up because the Life Aquatic and the Man of Steel have two glaring, one glaring similarity that I really love is the question, who are you going to kill in the next one? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, another piece of trivia from IMDb, the Jaguar shark is one of the largest stop motion puppets ever constructed. It measured Whoa. eight feet in length and required five hand crank controls for its swimming action. And the movie is, uh, dedicated to Jacques Cousteau, whose son Felipe Cousteau senior died in a seaplane crash which in the movie, Ned, who most supposedly is Steve's son, dies after a helicopter crash. So there's there's little parallels there to Jacques Cousteau, which, um, you know, obviously Anderson was somewhat of a fan of, uh, you know, kind of a kind of a cool homage wrapped up in a complete character study of this total bastard, uh, Steve Zissou. Mm -hmm. Here, here. But, um, you know, that's basically all I have for the movie. I, you know, the reason it's so divisive, you know, like you were saying, one of our friends uh, you were talking to recently was just talking about what a com how much he absolutely hates this film. Yes. Um, but... You know, if you don't have the patience to watch and rewatch the movie, I can completely understand why people don't like it. Yeah, it's a it's a genre that people aren't gonna enjoy, identify, or get entertained by. That's right. understandable. And you know, stylistically, in terms of a movie that is distinctly in a style, um, I don't think Wes Anderson has. There's there's no other director other than Tim Burton that I can look at and go, okay, these styles are so unique that you could look at one scene from the movie and say, that's a Wes Anderson movie, that's a Tim Burton movie. You know, there's not very many directors out there that have so much detail in every scene and so much artwork in every scene that you can just instantly recognize their films. That um, has their name all over it. Yeah. It's a signature Wes Anderson piece. You know, I was a little worried when he was adapting 
the Roald Dahl uh, book, um, Miss Fantastic Mr. Fox. But he took that book, which I've never read the book, but he took that and he he made it his own. You know, it is you watch that movie and it is very distinctly Wes Anderson. But that's kind of what's cool about how he does movies. You know, love him or hate him, you have to give him credit. The dude is an absolute artistic genius. Love him or hi- hate him. Love him or hate him. He definitely can tote that artistic, artistic flag for sure. And that's definitely something. I don't even know any other director. I could say like Sam Raimi. I can see him in some of the scenes of his movies. But mm. he doesn't really... He doesn't really, aside from what we know him from, it's kind of it's like, oh, the editing that I could see in Spider-Man, the first Spider-Man, right. that is, I can see Evil Dead in that. But that's not even, that's just cinematography and directing. That's not right. even really anything artsy fartsy at that point. Right. Yeah. That's so a- that might just, that might be even a bad metaphor but that's all that i can think of really they're like wes anderson and tim burton are kind of in a, a little bubble a shell of their own right that's kind of a, that's a good point you know um sam raimi you would almost say there's a venn diagram where he kind of fits into that as well um you know obviously there's directors like martin scorsese or steven spielberg stanley kubrick that you know if you watch the entire movie you can you can go oh this is a kubrick picture uh you know with these long panning shots and these quiet scenes and stuff like that but um or pick out uh dialogue or you know basically any scorsese movie is going to be over the top and violent um a tarantino picture may be the same but Mm, in terms in terms of scene by scene you could literally show a screenshot of any Wes Anderson movie or any Tim Burton movie to me. And I would be able to tell, tell you who directed that film. Yes. And I agree. And that is what sets them, those two apart. And that is a very great observation. All right. Well, that, that wraps up this episode of Next Level Nerds Movie Podcast. Um, please check out uh, the recently updated uh, website of uh, nextlevelnerd.com. Follow us on Twitter at NLN Movies. Um, also, check out uh, our producer, Ashton, and his brother, and uh, Evan Ruby and uh joe gaffney's uh podcast 321 lay on presented by next level nerd uh their larping podcast they have an episode coming up soon that i was on um where they kind of explain larping to me um you know it might not be your cup of tea but uh it was really fun to record that and kind of pick their brains about what it's like to be a grown man playing with foam swords in the middle of a park. And Oh, that sounds like a great educational it, um, it, episode. It was, it was really interesting to me to kind of dive into that world. And I kind of hope they, they have me back so I can uh, get on there and, and pick at them a little bit more and ask some more questions. Great shout out. And you know what? There is a market for that sort of stuff and there is a community and I'm into it, baby. Right. And uh, also, you know, like I said, feel free to uh, check out our Patreon site, patreon.com slash next level nerd, or you can go to nextlevelnerd.com and click on the become a patron link. Um, and that'll lead you to our Patreon site where you can uh, send us a buck or two and, and that'll help us, you know, during some of this expansion, we're trying to bring on some more shows about um, video gaming, um, you know, being a, a nerdy father in the 21st century, uh, comic books, all those kind of things. Um, we're looking at uh, doing a TV show, a uh, podcast, uh, where we kind of binge watch a series and discuss it uh, in great detail and, and those kind of things. Um, so, you know, feel free to drop us a buck or two. It really goes a long way towards bringing um, bringing you some more high quality entertainment. Um, big shout out to Mike Lamenza, our producer for this month, who has, uh, you know, sent us some money on Patreon to help us out. 
And, you know, we just appreciate that so much. We are humbled by your plentiful gifts. Humbled, sir. All right. Well, I'm Justin. He's Mitchell. Um, That's it for Next Level Nerds Movie Podcast. We love you. Love you lots, script kitties. Bye-bye. Representing Cashmere 1-9.